welcome. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks very much for coming to hear about letter writing, Ellen Hutchins' letters, taking you back in time to 1809 or thereabouts, 210 years ago. It's actually a really good date to do this, because it's, ex it's exactly when Ellen had a very significant visit from three botanists, a Welsh botanist called Lewis Dilwyn, a friend of his, another botanist, Joseph Woods, and a young chap who became quite a significant botanist, William Leach. And they arrived for breakfast at Balaliki on Monday the 17th of July. So in terms of the week, this is perfect. Um, this, is, this is a good time to be marking and celebrating Ellen's life. Um, I'm going to do the... Is that music in the cafe that can be turned off? No, good, right. yes. <laughs> don't want to compete. And can, can you hear us all right at the back? Is that, can, you, can you hear me? Am I talking loudly enough? Yeah, I'll, I'll try. <laughs> right, okay. um, um, I'm Madeline Hutchins. I'm great-great-grandniece of Ellen Hutchins, who was a botanist, the botanist really, of Bantry Bay, became Ireland's first female botanist. She was born in 1785 in Balaliki House, she lived nearly all her life there, apart from a brief stay, we don't know how brief or long, in Dublin. So all the work she was doing, the work she was doing on picking up the seaweeds, making the specimens, um, collecting and, and identifying mosses, liverworts, lichens, those were her specialist areas, it was all done here. It was done in, in a Bantry Bay and the mountains that surround. And that was her great delight. She loved the, this countryside. Um, she was very much self-taught, um, apart from, as I say, some tutoring and help from two uh, botanists in Dublin. One, Dr. Whitley Stokes, who was Regis Professor of Medicine at, the physics they called it, but it means medicine, at Trinity College Dublin, and a very keen botanist. Botany was the medicine cupboard at the time. So anybody studying medicine had to know their plants because that's what the, they, they were providing as the medicines to people. And the other person who was very significant in her study of botany from Dublin was James Mackay. He was botanist in charge of the Botanic Gardens at Trinity College Dublin. And she sent him most of her... To start with, she was sending him her specimens and he passed them on to others. And she very rapidly became a very significant member of a very specialist botanic community, individuals studying botany um, across, well, across Ireland and England at the time, and Wales at the time, um, trying to understand more about the seaweeds and these little non-flowering plants, the mosses, the liverworts, and the lichen, which were very, very poorly understood at the time and not, and not studied much. So that was one reason she was so successful at finding things. The other thing is, is she was in Bantry Bay which has the, the most incredible biodiversity, particularly botanical biodiversity. So she was in exactly the right place and exactly the right time, and she proved to have the right skills. Um, skills and determination. She was curious, she wanted to know more about it, she was determined, she went down again and again and again to check on the growth of a plant, spotting when it had started growing in that form last year, is it earlier, is it later, what does it look like in August, and on and on. Um, so she had just the right skills for what she was doing. Though it's interesting, she still talks about her botanising as an amusement. She plays very light with it, even though she was actually you know, a serious, well, use the term scientist, it hadn't even been invented. The term scientist didn't come in until 1833. And she was active between 1805 and her incredibly early death at the age of 29 in 1815. So really in seven and a half, eight years, she did what most of us would have been extremely pleased to do in her long lifetime. Um, so, and she had caring responsibilities for her uh, mother. Uh, she was the only girl surviving in the family. There had been 21 children. Only six survived their, their infancy um, to, be, to become adults. And she was rapidly was the only surviving daughter. So she was called back home from Dublin to care for her mother who's described as elderly at 57, interesting, and a disabled brother who'd fallen in an accident um, skating on ice at school and damaged his spine badly. So she was juggling between the homebound activities and being able to go out and, and botanise. Um, so that, that's in a, in a nutshell, that's Ellen's life in a nutshell. Coming to the letters, 
we were really fortunate in 2012 to find or probably re-find a pile of letters she'd written to her brothers, about 50, that she'd written to her oldest brother Emmanuel and her little brother Samuel. Um, so they're quite different in style. Samuel was 17 years older than her and it's a bit like writing to her father. He was the father figure of the family. Samuel was just younger than her and he was very much a good friend. So you get that sort of sibling, brother, brother, sister correspondence. We've only got the one side, we've only got the Ellen side. But those are the ones, and I know how many I put around the room and I want them back. There are seven. <laughs> there are seven going around the room. Of either out open like this, showing how the paper starts, and then you fold it to, to use it as three sheets of writing paper, then you fold it up again, like origami, and, and it becomes the letter. And you're going to hear a lot more about, about that. But that's where those letters come from. And we think it's lovely that we're hearing Ellen's story through her own words, through those brother letters and through botanist letters. There are 120 between her and Dawson Turner, 70 from her to him, 50 back from him to her. He was a very eminent botanist looking at seaweeds. And we've got a handful of ones between her and, and James Mackay and just a couple of others from a chap called William Jackson Hooker. Um, but it does mean that, that in a lot of cases we're... We're, we're hearing the story the way she did. We're reading letters she received, and we're reading letters that she sent. So there's a huge uh, synergy between her botany work and letter writing. And we're absolutely delighted to have been given a slot in the literary festival, in the letter writing cafe of Organico, to, to, bring, that, to bring that to the fore. So I'm gonna hand over to Carrie O'Flynn, who is in costume of the period, and will tell you about the letter writing and that side of it. And then she's going to hand back to me for a, a, a bit more about the correspondence with Dawson Turner, and then back to Carrie for some of the extracts from the letters. So again, we get to hear Ellen in her own words. And we have to be finished by 5.30. <laughs> okay, right. Yeah, we'll, I'll give you a more. So, um, in Ellen's time, letter writing was the main form of communication between people. Um, obviously, it's a lot easier nowadays with email and phone calls and things like that, but people back then would have lived sometimes quite remotely from each other, and they had to rely on letters uh, as their way of communicating basically everything. Um, so, you get a very intense um, period of, of letter writing throughout people's lives. Um, and it's, it goes from, um, as Madeline was saying, letters about, you know, that start off quite formal, um, about scientific subjects or, you know, purely, I guess, let's call it professional or, or topical things. Um, and then you have personal letters between family members, um, friends, um, and there was a, a huge etiquette around letter writing in the sense that, you know, when you returned letters, how soon you should be doing it, how you would address people, um, who you could write letters to, um, obviously between family and friends, um, it was quite common um, to people that you didn't entirely know, um, it would be quite extraordinary. Um, so the social convention at the time was that you needed somebody to introduce you to somebody that you didn't know. Um, and there was a very formal way of that introduction where the introduction was to the higher st status person. So. Let's say, for instance, Madeline was a lady and I was just a, a country gentleman's daughter. I couldn't, um, I would have to be to ask to be introduced to Madeline. Madeline would never be introduced to me, so you would never be introduced down the social scale. And letter writing acted in the same way. It was very unusual for you to take it upon yourself to write to somebody of a higher social status without some kind of introduction. And, and you see it in Madeline, we'll touch on it with the letters where. Ellen is sort of introduced to people or put in contact with people, um, particularly gentlemen, um, which again was something that wouldn't have gone on at the time. Gentlemen and ladies did not generally write to each other unless they were related. Um, and so um, to touch on a literary point, let's, uh, Jane Austen, I guess, and lots of you are familiar with her works in Sense and Sensibility, it's assumed that Marianne and, da and um, Willoughby are engaged because they're writing to each other. Um, and that was the social convention, was basically that there had to be some strong connection between you to, uh, for a man and a woman to, to write to each other if they weren't related by blood. Um, the letter writing materials themselves, you had um, obviously paper, um, and you can see from this letter, um, you, you get different sizes. So the letter sizes and shapes would be quite unusual from what we're used to nowadays. 
So we have very formalized uh, structures in terms of the A series of, of paper sizes. And um, back then, it was totally different and you would get large sheets of paper that you would cut down yourself to your own personal specifications. And these had names like Royal, Double Elephant, um, a, a lot of very, very strange names. Um, and that basically described the size and generally, as I said, they came in a very large sheet of paper. You brought that home, you cut it down into your, you, you made it, uh, you cut it down and then you would have created a folio with it. So you fold it over um, and you basically end up with uh, a little folio of paper. So obviously I folded this the wrong way. Um, so you would have written across the front on the inside uh, on the third page and then you would have left the last page blank. Um, and the reason for that then was that that would be your envelope basically. So the, 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 there's some different folds, but the basic fold at the time would be that you fold the sides in. It's very hard to demonstrate. <laughs> Um, you fold the sides in to meet each other in the centre, and this is very rough. And then you fold the top and the bottom up to meet each other, so the bottom fold should be slightly bigger than the top fold. And as I said, this is a smaller piece of paper. But you end up with what basically is an envelope, so you would seal the back part here, and then you would have your envelope on the front. Paper itself is extremely expensive, um, so letter writing tends to be a a more upper class pastime. Um, people of a much lower uh, income bracket would rarely have been able to afford um, paper, plus the ink, the quills, the postage, if you're receiving. Um, and this is one of the important notes at the time is that the person receiving the letter paid for the postage rather than the person sending the letter. So yeah, um, and it wasn't until um, basically the, the, the postage stamp came into being that the sender became the person who was paying for the letter. And um, you also paid by the sheet. So this would be your single sheet of paper, but if you enclosed a second sheet in that, you were paying double the cost. So people become, and, and again, you'd see it on Madeline's letters, yeah. The yeah. People become very, very good at using every scrap of paper they could. And um, so you write one way and then you get the cross writing where you turn the page 90 degrees and you write the other way. And I've seen ones where you turn it another 45 degrees and you're basically writing in three directions across the page. Um, and even the envelope side wasn't wasted because you end up by folding with a square in the center and the two bits on the top here that are basically your envelope fold. But no one's going to see the two bits at the side because they're folded into each other. So people would write on those as well. Um, and, and, it, and it became quite a, a skill um, to, to try and decipher a lot of these. Um, it's a lot easier if you're familiar with the person's writing. So if it's somebody like a sister or a friend that you write to quite often, it does become a lot easier. Um, and as well, they're not going to mind that you're only sending them one sheet of paper. Um, again, coming back to um, the idea of, of sort of giving your due respect and deference to your, your betters. Um, if I was writing a very formal letter to someone of a much higher social status, um, I wouldn't skimp on paper because it's a bit of a snub really to be honest you're kind of I suppose intimating that they're not really worth two sheets of paper or they're not worth um, you know the, the, the ink that's been um, and the amount of paper that's been used um, the paper itself at this stage um, was uh, generally cotton but uh, linen previously but had been moving into cotton and it's basically a mulch um, that's so you have laid paper and then you have um, rag paper. So the laid paper would be of a, 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 an earlier type, but it was still in use at the time. The two types of paper were in use at, uh, concurrently. Um, and with laid paper, you often see it today in very formal documents, people still put that sort of um, grid work across it, I guess, as, as a feature. Um, back then it was a feature because the, the mulch was literally laid into wire frames and left to dry, so you had the imprint of the wire frame on it. Um, but as technology improved, the paper became a lot smoother. Um, and again, you sort of, you know, as with everything, there's an element of um, observance of social status in the sense of you're going to keep the better paper for somebody that you're trying to impress um, or should be looking to, um, to show respect to. Um, the postage system itself, then, as I said, so Ireland um, had its first has had its own post uh, official postage system from the seventeen eighties, 
um, and this is where the male coaches would have been brought in on an official um, grounding. Um, and it ran as its own post office until after the Act of Union in 1800, and then it would become part of the Royal Mail. Um, you, as I said, paid um, per sheet, and you also paid per distance. So, for instance, anything within 15 miles, you might have paid a penny for it. Um, and you find it in, and it increases then as the distance goes on. And those distances are drawn in a straight line. So you would be paying for the distance from Cork to Dublin in a straight line rather than the actual journey. Um, and so on, and for Bantry to Cork. Um, and then, obviously, if it went across the water to England or another country, you then had the steamer. Um, so generally the, the Cork Post went uh, by packet to Bristol where it would then be picked up and taken by Royal Mail and, and distributed uh, in the UK. Um, so the, the greater the distance you're, you're basically adding at least a penny on every time. Um, and um, in the early 1800s this was um, altered slightly and, and the rates all went up by about a penny. Um, but penny was you know, really a pretty considerable amount of money at the time for an awful lot of people. Um, and as I said, you're, you're paying it as the recipient. So you do get in places like, um, you know, small towns like Bantry or other places, um, you will try and avoid paying the post, or rather you would try and avoid incurring the post for somebody if you could. So let's say, for instance, a servant was taking messages into the town, you would send a letter with them to try and avoid the actual post. Just, you know, it's a nice favour to do for people. And um, the other uh, items that you obviously needed to write with would be your quill, and I think there's a couple of them going around there. Um, so these are generally taken from the wing feathers of largely geese um, at the time. Um, you do get swan feathers, crow feathers, but generally speaking, geese would have been kind of like the big flyers of the time. Um, and they were bought in bundles. You could buy a hundred in a bundle, and they were actually surprisingly cheap compared to other. Um, other uh, materials that you would have needed to write your letter. Um, so, uh, again, going back to Jane Austen, um, in the, the, the 1995 Prime Prejudice, where Mr. Darcy is writing the letter to Elizabeth, and he's sharpening, um, in the TV series, he's sharpening his pens himself. That generally would not have happened unless you were kind of an enthusiast about doing your own pen. They were cheap enough that you would literally buy them, sharpened, and use them until they went dull, and then you would throw them away. Um, while you were writing, you would have several pens on the go, and this is an original um, ink pot from the time. Um, so there's a little ceramic insert where you had your ink, and you could take it out and clean it, and then you had your, your metal pot itself. And you can see in the top that there's some holes around the top, and that's where your quills would go. So you would uh, store them in there while you were writing. But what would happen is that obviously as you're using the ink on the quill, the quill is getting wet and it's getting soft, so it's not holding a line as well as it should. So you pop it in, let it dry out, and then you would take another one that you use. So you would have several of them on the go while writing a letter, particularly if it was a very long one. Um, if you're writing a literary manuscript, obviously you're going to go through a, a, an absolutely massive amount of, of pens. Um, so um, to sharpen them, you would use, if, if you were the type, um, a pen knife, which is um, literally where the word pen knife comes from. Um, it was a very small utility blade that was used for sharpening quills. Um, and has kind of come into parallels now and has come into use as just a, a small, you know, sort of do everything kind of little uh, pocket knife. Um, in terms of writing, um, you generally didn't need a whole lot. Um, obviously, uh, the higher up the social state uh, strata you were, you might have a lot of um, accoutrements such as, you know, uh, desk tidies, a writing slope, um, boxes to store your private letters in. Um, but, um, again, to touch on the literary, I mean, if you go to Chalking House where Jane Austen used to live, she literally just had a small little round table and her pen and ink, and that's it. So you didn't need anything fancy other than the immediate materials. Um, you, as with most other time periods, um, a lot of, uh, I guess, um, material culture at the time, it's all about conspicuous consumption for upper classes. Um, so if you could afford to have a very beautiful writing desk, then why not? Um, if you couldn't, you just had to work within your means. Um, you also then had, um, actually this is the ink in the bag unfortunately, um, I, can, I can get it later, but um, sealing wax. So at the time um, it would have previously um, in history been um, literally wax, beeswax, but beeswax is quite soft and can be tampered with quite easily. 
So over different periods of time, the, the recipe would have changed until you get to the 17 and 1800s where there, uh, it's mostly shellac, which is um, a, sort of a brittle substance which comes from the, um, the, the shells of a certain insect. Um, and I don't know if any of you would have had a, a varnish cabinet and they would be shellac. It's the same stops, substance, more or less, but it makes it quite brittle, and it means that you can't once once the seal has set, you can only break it really, and um, it sticks to the paper as well quite a bit. And again, you'll see on Madeline's paper, some of them have holes where the seal has been torn, and um, so it's quite obvious if you're tampering with with the papers. And then you would have a, a, a an actual seal fob. So this is a very very small one, and afterwards you can come and have a look. But this is designed to hang from either a gentleman's um. Uh, equipage um, or um, women often would have little chains and have them displayed and it, again it's conspicuous consumption why have something you know very functional when you can have something pretty to do the same job um, so you get a lot of these a lot of desk ones then would be ones that weren't meant to be worn and they're quite large uh, and cumbersome um, a lot of the time would have had family seals on them, um, mottos as you get into the Victorian period, they become slightly more whimsical. Um, this one, um, I'm not entirely sure of the date, but it's probably early 1800s, but it has a tree on it, and it says, without, um, without your support, I die, which is <laughs> incredibly uh, overwrought. Um, <laughs> But they're like you. They're lovely little things, and people put an awful lot of thought um, and you know investments in, into these to make them. Um, I guess they were like jewelry, more or less. They were pieces of of, of portable wealth. Um, what else have we done that time? We have fifteen. Oh yeah, perfect. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, yeah, in in terms of um, places then where you would get your 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 letter writing stock, Cork had a number of stationers. Um, lot, uh, many large towns would have had places where you could buy your things and people had very particular um, feelings about where they bought their paper, where they bought their pens, who was best to go to for ink. The ink itself was made of uh, usually oak gall ink. Um, so um, on uh, oak trees there's a gall wasp, um, I don't know, I'm sure most of you if you've been on any kind of walk around will have seen them and um, the larvae when they're hatched uh, on the tree they basically more or less start burrowing on the bark and the tree forms a gall, uh, which is like a little ball the size of, I guess, a walnut, around it and it encapsulates the, the wasp larva and eventually the wasp uh, emerges and the galls are left behind, but they're extremely high in tannins. Um, so they stain quite heavily um, and they've been used for centuries to make ink um, in different uh, recipes, but generally speaking involving um, crushing them up uh, mixing them with some kind of iron, um, so you might have iron filings if you were doing it in modern day, um, and then with a binder such as like gum arabic or gum trabicant, which would um, help keep stick it to the paper, um, and then other people, uh, different stationers, but often if they made their own ink, they had different recipes, and that's why people kind of thought, no, this ink is better than this one. But um, it's quite interesting because when you, it, it can look quite. Um, sort of weak and anemic when you start writing, but as soon as it hits the air, it oxidizes and it starts getting instantly darker, um, and it darkens up quite quickly. And it's a lovely thing to see because it, it looks so, like, so watery when you first apply it. Um, so that was how most people, had kind of a bit of a sepia tone, um, and generally speaking, that was the basic type of ink that most people would use, as I said, obviously, like everything, you know, people added things and took things away, but, but the, the general basics were you needed um, iron from some kind of source, um, uh, to, to, to create the chemical reaction um, and, and the crushed up oak galls and, and a binder, um, usually in a, in a water base. Um, the problem with a lot of historical documents is that um, oak gall ink is really, really acidic um, and a lot, a lot of times it, it eats through the paper. So you do get historical documents where the lettering has literally been removed um, over the years because of the fact that the, the ink was so uh, acidic. It doesn't happen with everything, but if, if, if it's a particularly strong ink recipe, then it often will eat through through the paper, which um, wasn't an issue at the time, but does pose significant issues uh, for, for researchers. Um, so um, that's uh, generally the basics. Um, the post in Cork would have gone from the GPO. Um, and if you look at maps, um, from the time the post office in Cork City moved about um, a few different places back then, 
Um, at one point it was um, down uh, by the, the Dole office in Cork City. Um, another point it was on Caroline Street, which is up um, behind Debenhams nowadays. Um, it didn't settle in the current GPO um, area to like the Victorian period. Um, and uh, one of the points, um, and I think probably around the time that Ellen would have been, um, or just before Ellen would have been um, in Cork and um, other people would have been using the post office would have been, um, if you're familiar with um, the end of the South Mall where the National Monument is, um, it, it, there's a building, the building's actually still there, um, and it was a gentleman's club as well at one point. Um, not that kind of gentleman's club. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, and it's now the, uh, the Crawford have taken it over as, as part of their department, but um, it, would have been, it would have been set there. Um, so um, people, uh, the mail would have come up on the coach, been sorted in the office, and then you would have had um, sort of several times a week, um, and again, in, in you get um, almanacs at the time, and they're very specific about when it leaves. It's, it's X day to go to Dublin. It's this day to come from somewhere else. Um, and it goes out, and it takes uh, I think right about eighteen hours or thereabouts to get to Dublin um, from Cork um, at the time. So um, you know, which is which is a, a pretty hefty distance. It was usually done. Um, it would be an overnight, um, an overnight operation, um, and then from there. Again, distributed to smaller post offices around the country when the, when the system started getting bigger. And um, previous to that, um, there was sort of an uh, I hate to call it informal because it was quite formalised. Um, but it would have been a I guess a private um, network. It wouldn't have been state run in any way of post boys and other couriers and messengers who would have more or less completed a lot of the same functions, just probably on not on so grand a scale. Um, and individuals then, as I said, um, they would have undertaken to, to, to bring the letter where it needed to go um, through the network of, of, of post boys. Um, and again, the person at the end was paying. It's basically the 1840s um, when the first stamp is invented in the UK that uh, the person um, sending becomes the person who's charged for it. Um, and the penny post, when it did come in, it pretty much revolutionised everything and made it uh, completely... Um, you know, a lot more achievable for people, um, a lot more reasonable rates. Um, kind of, yeah, it, it made a, a big change in um, in the world of lecture writing. So hopefully that's given a bit of a an overview. <laughs> Great, thanks very much for that, Carrie. And those of you who've seen the letters that are passing around, you will have seen a lot of things she's referring to there. A lot of them have a seven written on them, rather clumsily big sevens. That's it was seven pence to get from Bantry to Dublin in 1805, 07, 08, that sort of period. And it was counted as 164 miles. Some of the ones folded up, you'll see, or all are open, you'll see it says Bantry 164. And that's the mileage done with a, literally just with a compass and circles from, from Dublin to Bantry. All the ink, all the, the seals are red except for one, I can see it over there, which is black. That's for mourning. When someone in the family had died, you used a black ink, a black, black, black wax seal rather than red, um, as you're saying on that. So what we're going to do now is, without a costume change, I'm going to change my label to Anne Secord, because what I've got for you now is a little paper about the correspondence between Ellen Hutchins and the eminent botanist Dawson Turner, um, who was a, came from a rich banking family who ran, helped run the family bank um, in what's now Great Yarmouth on the East Anglian coast of England. So as far east as you can go, it's pancake flat and desperately boring countryside. So it couldn't be more different from Bantry Bay. He says to himself, so I can say it. <laughs> so, um, but Ellen struck up a, com a, a correspondence with Dawson Turner that lasted for seven years and was incredibly significant, both for botany and for friendship. So Anne has done some research on both Dawson Turner and Ellen. She couldn't join us today, but she very kindly sent me her paper and said that I could, could give it. Um, she comes from Cambridge University. She's an, a research associate in the history and philosophy of science, and she's involved with the Charles Darwin Correspondence Project. project. We've got about 300 letters of Ellen's. They've got 14,000 letters in the Darwin Project. So I'm glad I'm on Ellen, <laughs> I must say, rather than Charles Darwin. But what Anne says, 
is it's hard to overstate the importance of correspondence in early 19th century botany and for science in general. Having an extensive correspondence with other botanists was not unusual. This was a time when there were very few professional posts in botany. Most scientific experts were private individuals making collections and working in their own homes. So therefore very disparate, not in university towns doing it there, but wherever they lived. Dawson Turner, a banker in Great Yarmouth, Norfolk, was one such expert, and his speciality was seaweeds. He was publishing descriptions and drawings of every species in a genus known as Fucus. Because seaweeds, like other non-flowering plants, such as mosses and ferns, had not been much studied by botanists, Turner was always on the lookout for new collectors and new observers the title given to the field botanists they'd be called now, or plant hunters, those who actually went out and looked, rather than then studied under the microscope, wrote up and published. It was, there was a division of those two types. He needed to gather reliable information from around the British Isles to catalogue as many species as possible and to understand the variations within a species. The way he managed this was through an extensive correspondence network, he was evidently thrilled when James Mackay in Trinity College, Dublin, told him about Ellen Hutchins in Bantry Bay and sent him, Mackay sent Turner, some of Ellen's specimens, uh, which he intended to include in his book. By way of thanks, in 1807 this was, Turner sent Ellen a gift of rare specimens via Mackay in the hope that this would encourage her to continue to send him her discoveries. Now, the introduction by Mackay meant that a direct correspondence between Turner and Hutchins became possible. Turner's first letter was a very formal, short little note addressed to Miss Hutchins, to which she replied in equally formal terms. And so started their seven-year correspondence, during which time they exchanged over 120 letters. A superficial, though significant, measure of their deepening friendship can be seen in the way they addressed each other. Initially, their letters started formally, started with a formal madam or sir. Within a, however, within about 18 months, Turner began to use dear madam. And just a month later, my dear madam. About as close as you could get in this period. While in signing off, he moved from a obliged and faithful servant to a sincere friend, sincere, sorry, friend, and ultimately, following Hutchins's lead, to an affectionate friend. During their seven-year correspondence, Ellen Hutchins gained a formidable reputation among botanists through her capacity to find, preserve, and draw plants. The letters from Turner inspired and sustained her right up to her early death at the age of 29, and the increasing intimacy of their friendship was reflected in their letters. Although botany remained the focus of the correspondence, when either had, neither had much use about, news sorry, about seaweeds, um, they engaged in discussion of Byron's latest poems, the works of other poets such as Walter Scott, The Lady of the Lake, um, and various names that have disappeared into history, like uh, Robert Southey, who was actually Poet Laureate at the time, but I don't think we've ever heard of him. Um, the literary output of women writers, art, and on Turner's side at least, family news. Hutch, um, Ellen, who suffered ill health and a troubled family situation, claimed that her correspondence with Turner was the one pure source of happiness in her life. It was through family links that Turner justified his closer friendship with Hutchins. Close epistopoly <laughs> relationships, uh, Anne says, between people of the same sex were common, but intense friendship between men and women outside the family, as Carrie said, required some way in which they could be sanctioned. Turner resolved this by asking Ellen to become godmother to his newborn daughter, telling her that the baby was to be called Ellen after yourself because he knew no female in the world whom I should so honestly wish a child of mine to emulate. Ellen wrote in reply, how glad I should be to feel connected with your family. This was really ramping things up a bit, this one. 
Um, they were both sustained by their correspondents, both uh, um, Ellen and Dawson Turner. When it became clear that Hutchins was so, Ellen Hutchins was so ill that her life was in danger, Turner assured her that he had been deprived of the, had he been deprived of the pleasure of her letters, he would long ago have sunk into apathy and indolence. In this sense, their correspondence was instrumental in the completion of Turner's seaweed volumes, which slowly appeared between 1808 and 1819. The delay in completing the work was due to extreme difficulty in arranging the seaweeds into some sort of classificatory order. Ellen was probably the only person to whom Ella Dawson Turner confessed how hard he was finding this. It was through their correspondence that we learned that Turner paid Hutch um, Ellen Hutchins the compliment of asking whether she had ever considered the question. If you have, he confessed, you will in the highest degree oblige and serve me by a communication of your ideas. Tell me how to distribute the British species and I shall have a foundation as I can easily build my system upon. I'm going to come off Anne's paper at that moment because I've recently seen and had transcribed the letter she did write back in reply. And blow me, she cross-hatched it. She wrote across it, she turned it round and wrote the other way over the whole thing. And you know, I'm not sure that Dawson Turner read it. <laughs> There's certainly not a lot of evidence of him picking up on her ideas. It's something I want to do some further research on. But I think she was in a hurry, she was to do it. Yeah, I'm being shown an example of the cross-hatching here. These, all the letters I've passed around are the ones between Ellen and her brothers. The ones she wrote to Dawson Turner are in beautiful bound volumes in the beautiful Wren Library in Trinity College, Cambridge. Um, lovely place to go and see them, but we can't have them here in Bantry. So this is, a, this is an example of the cross-hatching, and it, quite honestly, it looks more like a design, doesn't it, than a piece of writing. I can read it, I have read it, she has a terrible toothache and you don't want to know what the dentist, not a dentist, the apothecary did. Um, it's gruesome. So I've, I've nearly read every word of that one. Um, but yes, it'd be interesting. I'm doing a bit more research to see what happened to, did Dawson Turner manage to read her cross hatching? Ellen continued to write to Turner even when she was dying. The last two letters between the two of them turned out to be particularly poignant. A false report of her expected recovery from her cousin Thomas Taylor, led Turner to invite Ellen to visit Yarmouth in what turned out to be his final letter to her. Two weeks later, in her last letter to him, she declared herself still very ill and bedbound. Her physical suffering was terrible, but she suffered more from not being able to read or occupy her mind. Her very last written words to Turner were, send me a moss anything just to look at. Uh, the next letter Turner received from Bantry Bay was from Ellen's sister-in-law, Matilda Hutchins, and bore the news of Ellen's death. Turner, however, made one final reply, not in a letter, but in public view in his Seaweeds book. Although it may seem strange to us today, Turner's scientific work described not only seaweeds, but also the friendships he'd made through correspondence in the course of his work. Of all these bonds, those established with Ellen Hutchins were some of the most heartfelt. His tribute to Ellen closes the final volume of his work and ends with quoting an 18th century poem called Tears of Affection, a poem occasioned by the death of a sister tenderly beloved. Before this, he had stated, that I have by Miss Hutchins's, putting in untimely death, been deprived of a most noble assistant, and that botany has lost a votary. This work bears abundant testimony, that's his book. But few, if any, except myself, can appreciate her many amiable qualities. Her liberality, which means generosity, her pleasure in communicating knowledge, her delight in being useful. Three years have now elapsed since she died, and every succeeding year makes me deeply feel what I have lost and how with her is gone a great part of the pleasure I derived from these pursuits. On the completion of his book of seaweeds, Turner gave up botany and turned to antiquarian studies and collecting signatures. 
it's clear that without his correspondence with Ellen, Turner's book might not have been finished and we would not have as good a picture of Ellen's life and achievements. Back to being me. <laughs> uh, what we now want to do is, is, is Carrie in costume is going to read some extracts some from, from some of Ellen's letters. Um, and well, between we're doing a bit of a double hand around me. Yeah, you've got you've got the most of them. Yeah. Um, okay, and we're all, we just saw it. Right okay, just, <coughs> oh yeah. So let me just introduce the first one. The first one shows, I think, how bold Ellen got. She was terribly timid in the first letters, and she was asking questions of Dawson Turner, who was answering them. But she became bolder and bolder in her own views on things and telling him them. Uh, yes, I think that's right. That? Yeah. Yeah. I will tell you what I have often wished, that when Historia Fucorum was at the end, when you give your arrangement, you would give a place to illustrate each genus not published in the work. For I imagine you will arrange all the submerged algae and how it can be well done without plates. But perhaps my fancy does not suit your plan, or that if you mean to proceed in the publication of such plans, it may be quite unnecessary. I hope you will not think me very impertinent. I suspect I am so, but I want to lay my faults upon you and to hint that you have encouraged me to plague you. Of late, my whole heart, or rather the little botanical spot in it, has been given up to younger Manier. I am glad you were so pleased with my last, and I hope before long to have a very favourable account of them. Was I, uh, was I not a desperate blunderer about J. Lyelli? I enclosed J. Mackay in a very fine stage for Mr. Hooker. I promised to send it in November. He wanted the seeds which those specimens contain. Okay, I think that's quite a good example of how busy she is on sending things. And the Mr. Hooker she mentions is William Jackson Hooker who became he was knighted for his services to botany while he was professor of botany at Glasgow University and he became the first director of Kew Gardens in London and his son became the second director. Um, and his son was also, he married the eldest daughter of Dawson Turner, so it's all in the same family really. Um, this thing about the passion for plants, she was absolutely passionate about certain particular plants. One of them was the large flowered butterwort. Um, and she says, I'm so warm on the subject of this plant that I'm tempted to enclose you a specimen. And she does, actually. It's in the letter, um, in, the, in the one in Cambridge. Um, on to, yeah, more of. How long can you look through a microscope at one thing? <laughs> You've got there. The masses from you and the younger manier from Mr. Hooker were highly acceptable, as well as the drawing of C. Curabessens, which is in a very strange state and quite unlike any conjugata I have ever seen. But talk not of wonders until you see a sketch of the conjugation of C. Uh, Dicillians. I will send it in my next, which shall be very soon. I spent five days examining it, and I am certain I sketched it as I saw. So five days under the microscope, and quite honestly, without a microscope, it's just a green blob. <laughs> so it looks absolutely beautiful through it. Um, oh, well, the next one is a bit of period detail. They're blistering, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Uh, oh, and the, the delight in receiving letters. <coughs> How sweet a preparation of the medium of life is a kind friend's letter. Such, my dear sir, was your last to me. It came at a time when its effect was most wanting, just when I was shivering over the fire after having taken a blister from my side, where I had for a long time passed a fixed pain. I am now better a good deal, but not good for much, or able to make any active exertion. Your letter gave me variety of pleasure. Uh, and as I was saying, if it wasn't seaweeds, and this thing about this was a, a, a typical way, rather than taking, letting blood, which they also were still doing at that period, this idea of causing a blister on the skin, because that was supposed to, <coughs> to help the organ underneath. Medicine was appalling at the time. Um, and <laughs> Literature came up in a lot of her letters. Lord Byron gets a mention, doesn't he? Yes. More than one. <laughs> I have just read Child Harold. How do you like it? Parts of it delight me extremely. I am more sure that he, Lord Byron, can write fine poetry than that he is an amiable man. 
I do not like his severity towards women, and some other parts of his poem do not please my mind, but are there not beautiful passages in it? <laughs> and Walter Scott is another, is another one. He was, um, at the time he was writing long narrative poems. He hadn't got into the novel. The novel really hadn't arrived yet um, at the time. A Lady of the Lake came out in 1810, I think about March. The heroine in it is called Ellen, interesting. And this is her writing to Dawson Turner. I am much, very much obliged by your wish to send me the Lady of the Lake, which I was so fortunate as to get in Dublin, where there was hardly a copy left. I have read it with more pleasure than I can describe. I like it a great better than either Marmion, great deal better than either Marmion or the Lay of the Last Minstrel. It seems to me better kept up. All this and the description of the wild country and fine lake is very delightful and the sentiments and feelings of such characters as are painted very natural and beautiful. I read it over and over with new pleasure, with what ease and spirit it is supported. Having little leisure during the day for reading, I sat up the night after the book came and never perceived how the time glided by until daylight appeared. <laughs> um, oh, and she's, yeah, she's on about Tasso as well. Um, Yet I cannot get poor Tasso out of my head or help wishing that his friends had known better how to treat such irritable feelings. I found a great deal that was very interesting in his life. I, would, I have always loved reading Lives of Great Men since I was a child. I read those of Plutarch's. Um, and, a, oh, yes, so... Um... We can either open up for questions, or we can make you cry with more of her last words. <laughs> so, whichever you, you like. <laughs> you want the last words, right? Yeah. Being asked if, if you didn't hear how the specimens travelled, two ways. Um, either they were little ones, that which I mean, quite honestly, a lot of the stuff she was dealing with is little, or the detail she wanted to show of it is little. In which case, it would just be in that folded letter, sometimes attached to a tiny little piece of paper that had been slipped in, probably hoping the post office didn't notice that it should have been more than the seven pence. Yeah, on that. And other times they were on the whole of one of these same. She, she seems to have used the same paper for letters, drawings, and specimens. So they're very much, they're, well, they, yeah, they're slightly under A4, actually. They, most, of the, most of the specimens, they're sort of that down a bit that she's used for them. And they would have gone in parcels. So very often she talks about the packet I'm sending you, yeah, or in the next parcel, or in my next. That'll either be a parcel going a, a similar route, but it, obviously a, a, in a sort of box thing. And really quite interestingly, some of the boxes were clearly quite sizable, because one of, them, one of the first ones she sent to James Mackay, he said, I'm returning the box to you now with plants for your garden. So he's used the same box as come back, and he's put it into a load of cistus and flocks and roses, I mean, probably tiny little seedlings of, from the botanical gardens in Dublin, for her garden in Balaliki. So I mean, the, the, yeah. the, the butterwort would have gone pressed or fresh? Um, she usually tried to send things pressed, um, because they didn't know quite how long that letter was going to take to get where it was going. So um, there's quite, if she has sent things fresh, there's very often a response saying it didn't survive, or it didn't get to me in a state where I could see anything of it. Yeah. So, so yes, the, that, the, the, dry, the careful drying before you committed it to the post meant it was more likely to get there. But she'd be trying all sorts of things. We've got one example, and I illustrate it in the book that we're selling later. <laughs> um, we found in New York, she we'd seen her talk about putting them between two little bits of glass from her microscope, and she uses wax, probably the sealing wax from the letters, to hold the two bits of glass together. We found one in Botanic Gardens in New York in January, myself and my husband, when we were there, um, that is one of, so we now know what they look like. Um, um, so, and she, oh, she... She experimented with whether she could find it. She said, if only I could find a liquor in which to preserve plants. Um, I've tried brandy, um, and it keeps the form of the plant, but loses the colour. So she was, she was experimenting all sorts of ways, and packing things with moss, 
you know, when it wasn't a boss, obviously, but in order to try and keep things damp, to see if that worked. They were, and I think as a community, they were experimenting and sharing their experiments um, of how to, how to get these. But that's one of the reasons she went for drawing, because that was a way of showing someone at a distance what it looked like when fresh. Because you couldn't just take a picture with your phone and WhatsApp it. You know, it was, you're really, your only way was, was the drawing and, and the post. Yeah. No, they didn't. No. 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 Um, I mean, he, he had a wife and a family, but when his, sometime later on when his wife died, age 70-something, he eloped to Gretna Green with a much younger woman. Wow. Which does make me wonder what might have happened if, yeah. if they'd met. Or, if, or more realistically, if they'd gone ahead with this idea of her saying, I'll do the illustrations if you do a book of seaweeds. Right. Yeah? And later on, later from that letter, he says, would you co-write with me a book on the lichens? So the what-ifs, if she'd survived longer than age 29, I think are just delightful to contemplate, really. Yeah. 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 She was mostly self-taught um, in terms of her education. The, the fact she was sent to school, which at that stage is quite unusual for a girl. Um, um, so it, it would appear that the Hutchins family educated boys and girls over the generations. And we know definitely she went to school in Dublin. We don't know what age is between, and we don't know how long she was there. Um, but, and then she was, and after that, it was Dr. Mentor figures, really. Dr. Whitley Stokes followed by, in Dublin, giving her some books. Um, prob I mean, he was terrible at correspondence, so I suspect it was while she was in Dublin, rather than him writing to her in Bantry, because I found very little evidence of him writing any letters at that period. He was a young family man then. Um, he, he became very famous when he was older. We tend to think of the old Whitley Stokes, but the, he was a young man. His wife was having babies at this period. Then it was James Mackay, who visited down here, but he was in Dublin. Um, he was Scottish, but he'd been brought over to run the Botanic Gardens in, in Dublin, at Trinity College Dublin, and then it was Dawson Turner. So really, it was, it, it was almost like the baton was handed. I mean, all, all of, she continued sending things to all of them, um, but the one who really developed her was Dawson Turner. So some of the letters have got an entire list at the back where she's asked a list of questions, and he comes back with, your number one is this, and... The, the thing you sent me is that, isn't it something else? And it's literally, it's that way. And sending the specimens to each other, he sends to her as well. So it's a bit like, it, that's, you can't look it up. The, the books of the time hardly ever had drawings in. The ordinary botany books were just writing, and perhaps three or four diagrams at the back. So the, the people she was working with were the ones <coughs> developing the big expensive books that would have the drawings. But the stuff, that the, most of the books she had to refer to would just have been writing. So to have a specimen <coughs> sent to you of, you know, this is what this looks like, you see if it matches the one you've found on the strand, uh, was a huge value. So people making their collections at home, the herbaria, as they're called, a herbarium, was for a scientific purpose. That was their encyclopedia or their book, in effect. It wasn't just to have a one of everything sort of collection, which is what we tend to think of collections now, don't we, as a hobby. You, know, you want to collect a thimble of every sort of whatever or have all of something else. Um, this was very much that it was part of the, the, the necessary things you had as a, as a botanist, was to have the collection. It's a reference library, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is there any record of her uh, feelings about him and other correspondents? Um, so any record of Ellen's feelings about Dawson Turner and other correspondents? No, not found it yet. I must say, I haven't finished all of the letters to the brothers. It's this crosshatch thing. Um, I'm working my way through, but I've not finished all of them. But I very much doubt that she would have said anything to either, even little brother, um, about that. So I suspect we're not going to find that. Well, it's interesting because in his letter to her, we haven't got all the letters, there are some missing. In his letter to her, he says, if you didn't leave Riv at such a distance, I would invite you to be the godmother. And her reply says, I'm delighted to be the godmother. Yeah. <laughs> so whether there was a bit of a fudge there, yeah. um, 
Right. I don't know. I don't know. Um, but I mean, it, I don't know if it was the thing at the time then, but Protestants have two of the same sex and one of the other in terms of godparents. Mm. So maybe yes. you can get away with having one at a distance that right. isn't actively there. Right. I mean, I'm yeah. here with godmother, um, and on the day of the baptism, I was ill, I couldn't go. I'm still and it's still, it's still worked. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Several hundred years later. But yeah. Still. Yeah. yeah, you get a lot of things done by proxy as well. Yes, um, yes. Obviously, true, I mean, yeah. it's a bit more important, sort of, in previous centuries in terms of marriages at, at, at very, very high levels of social strata. But, you know, there, there's, I don't see why you wouldn't have a stand in. Yeah, for that, for that interesting. Okay, I think we have to wrap it up. Well, thank you very much indeed. <laughs>